number of our speakers is that what we're really talking about here is maybe one of the most fundamental and profound transformations our nation has has, has ever uh, attempted and uh, and and it isn't just about technology although that's important it isn't just about finance although that's important it isn't just about behavior but that's important it's how you package that all together to really drive transformation and we're we're just really fortunate to have someone here who uh, knows quite a little bit about transformations. Uh, Linda's currently uh, leads the uh, uh, strategy for IBM's company-wide transformation uh, efforts. And uh, she's quite an impressive lady. Uh, starting in her uh, early days, uh, at, uh, growing up on a farm, uh, her accomplishments have been, uh, excuse the pun, no small potatoes. <laughs> she grew up on a potato farm, but uh, uh, <clears throat> she's uh, credited with reinventing uh, IBM's flagship mainframe computing business. Uh, she's a co-author of a, uh, a very important book on, on organizational transformations. And uh, she's widely recognized as one of the most uh, influential businesswomen. Uh, and this is by the likes of Forbes magazine, uh, Information Week, and uh, Working Women's Magazine. Uh, and, and let me say uh, how uh, pleased we are that she made the special effort to join us today, uh, traveling down from New York, uh, finishing up a meeting with her boss and, and, and jumping out an airplane to get down here. That's extraordinary effort, and, and we, we really appreciate it. And so I, I would like, uh, like you all to join me in, in wel welcoming uh, uh, I, the IBM Senior Vice President, uh, Linda Sanford, to the podium and, and ask her to share her experience and uh, advice on the ingredients for successful transformation. So. Well, thank you very much, uh, Terry, and uh, good afternoon to everyone here, and thank you all for uh, being a bit patient with me. Um, the, uh, the weather, I don't know if it has something to do with energy and climate or something, but uh, <laughs> the weather was a little bit uncooperative, but I did get here, and I wanted very much uh, to, uh, to, to really um, use the opportunity to share and to get some feedback from all of you as well um, on the major transformation that you are all going to lead here, because I think it is an extremely important initiative and uh, one that will have far-reaching implications. And so, first of all, thank you, every one of you, for giving of your time, your expertise, your experience to really help all of us address this very significant issue of ours. Um, you know, I, I, as uh, Terry had mentioned, I, I have the uh, good fortune of uh, working with our chairman, Sam Palmisano, to uh, help reinvent the IBM company. And, and it really is a fundamental transformation of an organization um, that was built in the 20th century with a very different business model into an organization built for the 21st century where things are very different. Everything from how we work, uh, leveraging all of the great new technology that's out there, but also dealing with how do you, how do you affect the change and, and, and uh, get the buy-in from your people, the culture, which I find to be actually, quite honestly, the most difficult and the most challenging to do. So um, this is, for me, year seven that I've been working with Sam on this. And, and as you can imagine, some of the fundamental transformations that we're all undergoing are so fundamental that it doesn't happen overnight. You can't flip a switch. Um, and therefore, you have to be in it you know, to, for the long run to, to affect the kind of change you're looking for. And so um, I'm here to share with you some of my own experiences and observations. I like to say the good, the bad, and the ugly, because we're not perfect by any, by any means. Uh, but we've learned a lot. And we make mistakes, but we kind of pick ourselves up and, and learn from those mistakes, adjust, and then move on again. So again, um, let, me, let me begin by sharing uh, some of my thoughts here. You know, when you think about it, you have, as I said, a very, very exciting opportunity to reinvent how we go about creating, reinventing, if you will, our national energy and climate policy. 
Now, that is a very tall order, and I'm sure you all recognize that, but it's also, I think, a very important chance to drive progress in a very critical area. It's an opportunity, not just a challenge, but an opportunity. And I also think that the uh, process, your, your idea to focus on process of policy formulation, rather than debating the policy details themselves, I think is a very important one. Because process and how you go about getting input and feedback, uh, and as a result of that buy-in from the many constituencies, will help ensure the stickiness the stickiness of some of the new changes you're going to be recommending here. So the goal of creating this very transparent and inclusive uh, process, I think, is absolutely the right one. So as I said, my goal today is to, to share some of our practical experience that hopefully will help to stimulate some of your thinking and also suggest a few ideas that you might want to explore in terms of the art of the possible um, in your breakouts uh, tomorrow. You know, I found that uh, all successful transformation efforts, and not just ours and IBM, but I've kind of studied a little bit um, many other organizations uh, who have also gone about transformation, that no matter what the organization or what the process being reinvented, they all share some very common traits. And those are the ones that I'd like to share with you this afternoon. And then also, at the end, hopefully we'll have enough time to engage in some interactive dialogue, get some of your thinking and, and challenges uh, in terms of some of the comments here today. Now, for a couple of reasons, I also want to say that, first of all, the economic crisis, as painful as it is, has really rocked every industry, every government around the world. We all know that. The severity of this downturn is also unprecedented, at least for those of us who weren't around during the Great Depression. And it represents more than just a cyclical downturn. It's a major shift in a very global economy. And companies right now, organizations of all shapes and sizes, are scrambling in order to reshape their firms, their organizations, in order to survive. And not only survive, but also emerge stronger on the other side. So the economic conditions are making transformation a requirement. I can't tell you how many conversations and phone calls and, and emails I get, letters I get, to talk about not, not just what and why we have to transform, but how do we do it. And so to me, that how question starts to indicate a readiness a readiness in populations, organizations, institutions around the world to transform and change. And at the same time, as I mentioned, these advances in technology have also converged to greatly expand the capabilities that we can leverage in order to evolve our organizations. In the last decade, we have seen our planet become smaller. We've seen it become flatter. And in the next decade, and sooner, I predict, we will also see it become smarter. And this just isn't a metaphor. It is about infusing real intelligence into the way that the world literally works. So what makes this possible? Well, first of all, our world is becoming instrumented. What do I mean by that? Well, you've got computational power being put into things that no one would recognize as a computer. Things like phones, cameras, cars, clothing, appliances, roadways, power lines, even livestock, and also rivers. Second, our world is also becoming interconnected. Very soon there will be two billion people on the internet. Two billion people on the internet. But that's just a fraction of what is being connected today. All of these things that we're putting sensors on, they also can be connected now. If there's a sensor, you can connect it. And so the amount of information that is produced by all of the interaction that's going on is just enormous, enormous. So there's an opportunity which I'll come back to. And then the third element is that all things are becoming intelligent. So now we have all this computing power. We have advanced analytics in order to massage and understand the data, and also new computing models, such as cloud computing. 
And all of this will help make sense of the vast digital knowledge that we have been collecting. And it turns all of the mountains of data into real intelligence and insight. So what this means to all of us is that the digital and the physical worlds, the infrastructures of the world, are converging. With so much technology and networking available at such low cost today, the opportunities do exist to make our companies, our institutions, industries much smarter, and also to be able to tackle some of the most vexing problems. Problems like wasting too much energy, spending too much time in traffic, squandering too much of the food that we produce in the supply chain, spending too much to deliver health care to too few, and of course, failing to manage financial risk adequately. It's obvious now that when you consider the trajectories of development that is driving the planet today, that we are going to have to run a lot smarter and more efficiently, especially as we seek the next areas of investment to drive economic growth and to move large parts of the global economy out of recession. Well, fortunately, we now can. So we see this in how companies and institutions are rethinking their systems and applying technology in new ways. And let me give you a few examples here. So Stockholm, they have a smart traffic system, and it has resulted in 20% less traffic. In fact, there's also been a 12% drop in emissions and a reported 40,000 additional daily users of their public transport system. Intelligent oil field technologies, they can increase both pump performance as well as well productivity. In a business where only 20 to 30 percent of available reserves are currently extracted. Smart food systems, such as one now running in the Nordics, can use RFID technology to trace meat and poultry from the farm, through the supply chain, to the supermarket shelves. So if there's an outbreak of E. coli, for example, it will be much easier to trace the origin of the bacteria. Now there are many other examples I could cite of forward-thinking organizations that are putting these smarter planet capabilities to work. But instead of telling you, let me show you a quick video that I think will explain smarter energy grids in sort of a whimsical way. If we could show the video, please. Electricity. It's the life force of civilization. It powers our communication, propels our transportation systems, and provides us with life-sustaining necessities such as heat, light, and television. Built in the 1940s, the utility grid sends a constant stream of electricity to your home. Since Excuse me, mister, all the time? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, what? Does it send out electricity during the day when nobody's home? Well, the grid doesn't know when you're going to be at home, so the power is delivered all the time. We get pizza delivered, but only when we order it. Pizza? I'm not following you. Well, if pizza was delivered to your house all the time, every hour and every day of the week, you'd have to pay for a lot of pizza. <laughs> but most of it would get tossed in the garbage. I guess I never thought of it like that. Interesting analogy. Give me that purple real quick. If the grid were just 5% more efficient, the energy savings would be like permanently eliminating the fuel and greenhouse gas emissions from 53 million cars. We should totally build a smarter system so it knows to deliver the power only when we need it. And that's the idea. This would let us synchronize supply with demand. People would have the option to pay lower rates during off-peak hours, and a digital grid would allow for greater input from renewable sources of energy like wind and solar power. That's really cool. What does that dinosaur represent? Oh, I just like dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are pretty cool. <laughs> well, cute, but I think also a lot of reality and a lot of truth to it, right? So, so we're really moving into this new age of the globally integrated and also intelligent economy 
an intelligent society and intelligent planet. And so the question is, what will we do with this opportunity? What will we do? Well, thanks again, I think, to the economic crisis, if I can say that in a somewhat of a perverse way, I guess. The precondition for real change now exists. People are ready. They want change. They're motivated. But this moment will not last forever, and we have to seize the opportunity and use this platform. We must have the right leadership and the right management practices in place to be truly effective. So let me now use the balance of my time, if you will, to touch on a few of the change management practices that I believe you might find useful in any successful transformation. And the longer that I'm involved in the transformation work here at IBM and the more customers that I talk with about their own experiences, the more I am learning about what works and what doesn't. And I still don't have all the answers, but I think um, a lot of what I have learned to date hopefully will be helpful here. So let me share with you what I have uh, kind of summarized into five common characteristics or five common elements that I found to be critical to effective change management. First of all, transformation movements in this day and age are democratic. And that's a democratic with a small d, because I, I want to keep things nonpartisan here, so it's <laughs> small d democratic. You know, the nature of transformation, as I said, has changed dramatically over the past 15 years or so. And I have also seen this in my own company. In fact, IBM's commitment to transformation really began back in the early 90s, when our business had hit the wall, literally. In 1993, IBM lost more than $8 billion, unheard of at that point in time. Our stock price had collapsed, hitting a 20-year low. The media was happily writing our obituary. And industry watchers were declaring that IBM was finished as a force in the industry. Well, you can imagine the impact on our customers, on our investors, and on our employees. The IBM workforce wasn't just demoralized. It was paralyzed. It was suspicious. It was hostile. And who could blame them, quite honestly? Well, between 1986 and 1993, they'd seen some 150,000 of their colleagues leave IBM. So with a plan at the time to break up the company that was on the table, IBM hired Lou Gerstner as our CEO back in April of 1993, and Gerstner realized the value that IBM offered to customers was its ability to provide end-to-end -end solutions to our business problems, not piece parts. So the breakup of the company just didn't make sense. And under Gerstner's leadership, IBM engineered a comeback in the 90s that I believe is considered one of the most you know, significant turnarounds in American business history. But by the year 2000, IBM's net income had grown to $8 billion on the plus side, which was a $16 billion turnaround from the dark days of the 1993. Well, I lived through those days. I was, I was there and felt every bit of the pain and, and ang angst that was in the system. And as difficult as those days were, I have to reflect, in some respects, Lou had an easier job when it came to energizing the organization for change. After all, we were on a burning platform. Everybody understood that we had to make dramatic changes and execute them fast if we wanted to survive. And in that environment, you can drive change largely by dictate. And indeed, people crave strong leaders to set the direction and also tell them where to go, and they will follow. Well, one of the challenges that Lou Gerstner's successor, our current CEO, Sam Palmazano, has when he succeeded Lou was, was how to continue that pace and energy behind IBM's transformation efforts. Because he knew transformation is non-ending. You're always needing to transform yourself. At the time of the CEO transition, the business was doing pretty well. So Sam didn't have that burning platform, that sense of survival. So he took a very unusual step of deciding to re-examine IBM's three basic beliefs, which were decreed by our founder, Tom Watson, way back in 1914, almost 100 years ago. And also, he decided to leverage technology and energize employees 
by asking them to articulate IBM's values and our aspirations as a company in the 21st century. Now, what made this exercise unique was how we did it, how we did it. We didn't have a group of executives sitting around a conference room table deciding, wordsmithing, a few kind of high-minded set of statements. We could have done that, but we didn't. Instead, what we did was engage every IBMer, every IBMer, about 320,000 at the time, in an open, what we called, values jam on the global intranet. So everyone was participating and dialoguing and interacting with each other on ideas of what our aspirations, what our values should be. Now, a jam is an online collaborative discussion for audiences that range in size from a few hundred to hundreds of thousands of people. Facilitators guide participants to build on each other's ideas. It's not a complete free-for-all. There is, a, there is a, a methodology that we follow, um, but it allows people to be very interactive with each other, to voice their opinion, to give their ideas, to have others bounce ideas off of each other. And then we also have real-time text analysis and data mining and those technologies were used to identify some of the emerging trends and also distill very actionable results. As you can imagine, there was a lot of commentary, a lot of dialogue. And so, impossible to read every word. But again, technology came in and, and was able to scan and read and pick out common trends and themes. Now, in our values jam, tens of thousands of IBMers weighed in over 72 hours. And you can still see uh, you can see here some of Sam's comments on the chart. I have to tell you, employees were thoughtful, they were passionate about the company, and they wanted to be very much a part of helping to establish our values for the 21st century. They were also brutally honest in a very professional way. They point out all the bureaucratic and all the dysfunctional things that get in the way of serving our clients. And at the end of the day, we settled on three common values. Dedication to every client's success, innovation that matters for IBM and for the world, and trust and personal responsibility in all of our relationships. So a very interactive, very democratic process where we engaged the, the energy, the passion of IBMers um, to really help us establish our values for the 21st century. And then a year later, we went back again and we held a follow-up jam. And this time, we focused on generating ideas for concrete steps that the company should take to ensure that those practices and policies and values are consistent, are consistent with the values. Employees voted on the top 35 ideas, all of which we have subsequently implemented. That feedback loop was very, very important. You know, if you're going to ask people for their opinion, they expect you to do something with it. They expect you to do something with it. They recognize you can't do everything. You have to prioritize. They helped us in establishing the priorities. And then we subsequently assigned owners, timelines, and gave progress reports to our employees. A very effective closed loop process here. Now, we've held a number of jams over the courses of several years to get input from employees, even from employees' families, on topics that range from emerging technologies that we should invest in to imagining what the enterprise of the future might look like. So jams have been a big part of our culture shift to empower our people to participate in decisions <clears throat> and also to make informed decisions based on our shared values. It's not a rule book. They have to make a choice, make a decision. They use the values as a guideline. By the way, many of our clients have also found these jams to be a very effective way to generate ideas, identify the best ones, and then also net them down to a manageable number. So you are really culling, if you will, what we would call the wisdom of crowds that gives you better insight. And as you can imagine, when people are participating in the input and the dialogue and the discussion, you are inherently getting buy-in from them. They feel part of the process. They feel committed to the outcomes, to the results at the end of the day. 
By the way, one of the other most interesting jams that uh, we have done externally was called Habitat Jam. It was sponsored, in fact, by the United Nations World Urban Forum. And it was a huge global brainstorming on the topic of urban sustainability. It included not only government agencies, academics, and relief organizations, but also actual citizens that were living in some of the world's worst slums. We set up internet cafes for them so that they could log in and share their ideas and feedback. We collected over 8,000 ideas between citizens and policymakers from around the world, 70 of which formed the, what we call the Ideas to Action Report, which has been presented and adopted at the UN's World Urban Forum Conference. So this is what I mean. I, I, I went a little longer on this first one than I will on the other four, but this is really, I think, very fundamentally important. This is what I mean by democratizing transformation. And the jams and other collaborative technologies are certainly ways to engage a broader constituency, um, and employees in this day and age very much expect to be part of that process. They want to have a say. They want to participate. And the same goes for citizens. In the Internet age, they want the 21st century version of the town hall. Think of it that way, the 21st century version of a town hall. So that was the first, and as I said, I spent more time there because I think it's a very important point. Second, governance models matter. You know, as I mentioned, I do have the opportunity to meet with clients frequently to discuss transformation, and it's, it's also one of my real delights in my job here because I always learn from them as much, hopefully, as I'm able to share with them. And one topic that comes up more often than you might think is governance. Governance sounds very prosaic, a little bureaucratic, but you would not believe how animated and excited business leaders get when I start showing them some of our governance models. Doesn't that look exciting? <laughs> well, fear or not, I'm not going to go through every one of the line items here. I just want to show you, um, you know, something that illustrates how in a matrixed organization like the size of IBM, with its multiple business units, its multiple geographies, multiple processes, you know, you must put a lot of effort into building a governance model that is comprehensive that engages all of the relevant constituents. As I said earlier, you want their buy-in and your, their input of the entire organization. And equally important, you want their accountability. They have to be responsible and accountable for their piece of delivering the results. Everyone has to have a skin in the game if you're going to uh, implement a company-wide, an organizational-wide, a, a, a country-wide, a global-wide transformation initiative. So my advice is get capable people working on governance. It's not easy. Make sure the representatives serving on the governance councils are in positions of responsibility, where they have the integrity or the, the, um, the, the, uh, they're leveraging their knowledge and their, and their integrity to actually drive results here. And one other point, I think, is these governance models are not static. They're not meant to be static. You need to take a fresh look at them every year if not more often, in order to make sure they're still serving the right purpose. We will often sunset a governance body and replace it with a new one as our priorities change. So governance models do matter. Third thought, turn information into insight. You know, as we all know, the volume of data and information continues to compound, literally, in incredible rates. The trick to building a smarter organization, though, is to figure out how to turn all of this information into an asset that leads to faster, smarter decisions. One of our most successful recent transformation initiatives has been creating and deploying new web-based analytical tools to help our sales teams. Our math experts in our IBM research facilities help to build these models, which are used to predict purchasing patterns for some two million companies worldwide. And this way, we're providing the sales teams insight on not only the opportunity, but who to call on and what to call on them with. Well, the tools have certainly contributed. We measure this. Um, on stronger revenue growth as well as higher sales productivity. And they've also allowed us to make sales resource decisions based on facts, 
which is so incredibly important, not emotions and not on how things were done in the past. You know, this is one of my great lessons learned. I, I wish I had started this, you know, seven years ago, not in the last four years or so, but often you get into these discussions and debates with an organization about change, and it's often, you know, emotional, you know? Nobody likes change. If things are going okay, especially, you know, why change is what they're asking. So unless you bring fact-based analytics to the table, it will be an emotional debate. As soon as we started bringing in the facts, you just, you saw all the emotion diffuse. And people are good, you know, reasonable, rational individuals. They say, that doesn't make sense, that's too complex. And then they go about changing it. Nobody has more data and information, of course, than the government. <laughs> And we've seen a great uptick in investment, in fact, in data analytics systems in the public sector over the past several years, from the U.S. Marines to the Singapore education system. The city of Albuquerque, for example, has achieved a 2,000% improvement in efficiency in sharing information across some 20 city departments, keeping their citizens better informed and also providing better municipal services from residential development to public safety. Leaders across the spectrum are taking advantage of new capabilities to interpret data to take a fresh look at chronic problems, even ones as hard to crack as street crime. Here's another short video that uh, I think will demonstrate how the New York City Police Department is using data analytics to fight crime in a smarter way. If we can roll the video, please. On Saturday, November 5th, uh, a male walked into a Midtown pizzeria. He ordered one slice of pepperoni pizza, sat down in the back of the pizzeria, and remained there until closing. At this time, the owner approached him and asked him to leave. The gentleman produced a silver handgun, took the owner at gunpoint around the counter, and removed a large sum of money from the cash register. On the way out of the location, the manager noticed that he had a tattoo on his neck. Had the word sugar written in it. Our old systems only gave us the capability to, to do certain queries, very limited search capabilities. It was in multiple forms, paper, separate databases, separate processes. The question was, how do we gather that information and get it to our officers on patrol? The answer to that is the real-time crime center. The RTCC provides information and investigative support to detectives who are investigating violent crime, and the information is delivered right to them at the crime scene. The detectives reached out to us with the nickname of Sugar. And we were able to bring back a man with a violent robbery history. We pulled up his photo and his physical attributes, and he matched the description to a T. Myself and a team of detectives from the Midtown North Squad went to a housing project. A group of us walked through the front door, up a flight of stairs, until we came to apartment 2B. We knocked on the door, and inside was our perpetrator. If it wasn't for the technology that's available here, we wouldn't have been able to solve this case. The police foundation has contributed significant amounts of money for components of the real-time crime center. Our hope is that every police officer has in his or her hand the kind of information that they need. We can marry all of these aspects, technology, software, services, um, to help the city of New York fight crime. What can help us in, in the short term and the long term, the obvious answer is technology, and we're going to do everything we can to make certain that New York remains in the lead in that regard. So again, I think, you know, another demonstration of how do you fight crime in a, in a smarter way here, leveraging data analytics in order to come to faster decisions, more accurate decisions. So next, collaboration. You know, if you think about the way the world actually works today, very few of our systems are the responsibility of a single entity or a decision maker. So to be a transformation leader, you need to be a, an adept collaborator, a cross-pollinator, if you will, who can bring together stakeholders and experts from across business, from government, from academia. More and more, this is where the real breakthroughs are coming from. You know, yes, we will always need the scientists and the engineers in the laboratory coming up with breakthrough inventions, but we really believe the real breakthrough, the real innovation is going to be much more collaborative, especially when you're trying to solve really complex problems like energy and climate issues. 
It can't be done by a small group, an individual. It needs to be a very collaborative, um, a collaborative approach. So as the world moves toward global integration, when you open yourself up to the world as an enterprise, there's just no way that you can be close enough to the action yourself to make every call. Further, no one person has all the answers. In this day and age, leadership is no longer just a tops-down proposition. It's both tops-down and bottoms-up. Command and control doesn't work either, but neither does the chaos of the gamer. The balance of both is really what will drive breakthrough innovation. If we provide our people with the tools to enable them and trust them, they will figure it out. And this is why several years ago, IBM took the unprecedented step of opening up our annual technology and business forecasting processes to the outside world with a program that we call the Global Innovation Outlook, or GIO. With the GIO, we hold a series of in-depth discussions with thought leaders from businesses, large and small, the public sector, academia, venture capitalists, and others around the world. And to date, we've had more than 55 GIO deep dives on five different continents. We brought together some 750 leaders to come up with big ideas to tackle big problems, like the global water supply, economic development in Africa, or how to build better cities. On the GIO website, we share the results of the reports and the recommendations that these thought leaders develop and open up the conversation through a GIO blog. The GIO discussions have led to some terrific ideas and new programs, including the World Community Grid, which is the world's largest public computing grid helping researchers tackle projects that benefit humanity. By the way, the public sector is ahead of the curve when it comes to the innovative use of collaborative technologies. And finally, communicating with employees and stakeholders using the Web 2.0 technologies. You know, the U.S. intelligence community's Intellipedia site has nearly 40,000 users. The National Weather Service is now publishing all of its data openly in XML, and it allows aviators to interactively plot weather data across a given route. Wikis, blogs, podcasts, mashups, tagging, the public sector is making abundant use of all of these new tools, and that's a great thing. I can tell you that within IBM social computing technologies, many of them in-house variations, behind the firewall, if you will, of popular sites like Facebook and Second Life have just soared in popularity as well as use over the last few years. The challenge is getting our leadership up to speed and comfortable with some of these technologies. And to help that, we recently launched a reverse mentoring program. What we've done <laughs> is pair up some of our best young web savvy talent with our top 300 executives, senior executives in IBM, to serve as their personal web 2.0 ambassador, as we call them. And we want all of our leaders comfortable with these. I, I don't expect us to be power users necessarily, but I want them to understand the power of these technologies. How to engage people from all corners of the earth who share passion, energy, expertise, knowledge on a topic, whatever that might be. You are unleashing the creativity and innovation of your people who very much want more and more to participate. So collaboration is fundamental to effective transformation today. And fortunately, there are a lot of new technologies that make this much easier to facilitate than in the past. Well, as much as I believe in the value of grassroots involvement in transformation, no change effort can be successful without the commitment and the active involvement of leadership. The organization's senior leaders must set the direction, establish goals, put the management system in place to provide the right rigor, as well as communicate results. One way to build momentum for transformation is to establish a few very high-profile initiatives that have great potential for achieving game-changing goals, one that will create a disturbance, if you will, in the force. At IBM, while we have a whole gamut of transformation projects underway, 
Every year we launch a couple of very high pro profile new initiatives as part of the work of what we call our integration of values team, this, the top 300 leaders. And we'll take a subset of them who will be assigned a project, for example, looking at how IBM can capitalize on the opportunity with some emerging new technology, and put them to work. This working group has the endorsement of our chairman and CEO, Sam Palmazano, and the senior team to see that the recommend recommendations that they develop are executed. The point is that leadership from the top is absolutely fundamental to gain traction with any transformation effort. So it's both tops down and bottoms up. Without it, no meaningful transformation, in my mind, will be possible. So these are some of the common ingredients that I've seen and, and uh, experienced and learned from, if you will, um, in effective change management efforts. And they are participatory. They have strong governance systems. They use business analytics to take advantage of the data and information they've collected. They look outside their own four walls for new ideas. And senior leaders show their commitment to the cause. As I said at the outset, this period of discontinuity is, for those with courage and vision, if you will, a period of opportunity. Today, people everywhere are ready. They are eager for a new way of doing things. All it takes is leaders who can see beyond the current crisis to the promise and the potential that we have to build a smarter planet and make a better world. Thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> take some questions or comments or suggestions. I know you guys have had a long day here today. Thoughts? Does it make sense? Yes. I Ken. Mentoring. mentoring? OK. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help you. I'll have to get someone much younger than me to help you. <laughs> I'm just curious, how does that work? Yeah. That uh, Do the top 300 really welcome that? Do they feel comfortable suddenly? they're in the reverse position of getting uh, advanced advice from someone maybe 20, 30, 40 years younger than they are. It's a good question, Ken. Uh, it's actually working extremely well um, for both sides, for, for the, the senior executives as well as the ambassadors. The ambassadors are, are quite honestly just happy to be able to work side by side with a senior executive, get to know a senior executive and them to know each other. And everyone has embraced it. The senior executives have, I've gotten so many notes back. Um, they will set up separate sessions. They have a particular business problem. And the ambassador helps them think through how to, how to get some information or solve a business problem using these collaborative technologies. So it's actually, it's not just a tutorial on how to tweet, you know? <laughs> it's, it's, it is how do I leverage the technology to so solve a real business problem? And when you put it in that context, there's very strong you know, uh, engagement and embracement by both sides. So, so far, so good. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But I didn't hear any. Mm. <laughs> Could you tell us what didn't work in your transformation? Yeah, I, I, you know, as I said, um, one of the ones that I have the, probably the most scars on my back is the fact that I wish we could have moved some things faster along. You know, early on when, when we were burning, you know, uh, this burning platform of, of survival back in the early 90s, that sense of urgency just drove things to happen um, at a very fast pace. In this latest phase of our transformation, things for us have been, you know, going going okay, and therefore, you know, the the need to accelerate um, the the change and the transformation has been more difficult. And 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 when we first got together, we had ideas, we had suggestions, we had recommendations, we'd get with the senior leaders running the business, but it was much more of a you know emotional debate. You know, you don't understand my business. I'm the one running it. Get out of my face, right? It was those kinds of debates, and scars on the back. So it it, it it's what caused us to step back and say we've got to get real facts here, put those facts on the table, and when we came back into those same senior executives with facts. You know, they're, they're professional businessmen. They, they stepped back, businessmen and businesswomen. They said, you know what? That doesn't make sense. 
So it was ugly in the sense that, you know, there's a lot of, you know, raging emotional debate. Um, and as soon as we learned that facts speak louder than the emotion, it really did help tremendously. So that's an example of one. Um, you know, we've had, we've had projects where, um, where we didn't get the input of the real user, you know, and, and that's another big lesson learned. So, you know, we would, we would work on process, you know, a new pro policy or a new process, and we thought, you know, we asked for some input, and then we thought we knew what they, me they meant. And so the process folks went to work, created this very efficient, very slick process, only to, to roll it out, and the end user said, what's different, you know? That's not what I meant. You didn't understand. You didn't un That's why this collaborative, c continuous, iterative interaction is so important. You hear, and then you go back and you say, okay, is this what you meant? No, not quite. So we do another twist, you iterate, and you go back again. And these technologies like JAMS or any of the Web 2.0 allows you to have that interaction which you couldn't do if, if you didn't have the technologies to assist you. So it's another way of, of you know, getting real, real user input, not just you know, what you think that is, that is meaning there. So some of, as a result, some of those projects took a lot longer. We stumbled, we didn't hit the mark, and we had to kind of step back, reset, and then go forward again. So it took a little longer than anyone, any of us would have liked in terms of delivering the impact to the business. Uh, thank you for a most inspiring and uh, uh, thought-provoking presentation. I'm curious about how you manage the interface. And you spoke about this a little bit, but maybe if you could reflect a little bit more. The Web 2.0 tools mm -hmm. come from a community, an ideology of, uh, of, of equality, of, of, in some sense, anarch anarchy, mm -hmm. uh, of uh, uh, deliberate rejection of hierarchy, of status, of position, uh, and uh, and yet you're grafting those into an organization which is the epitome of Weberian uh, bureaucratic structure with, uh, you know, there is SAM at the top, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, you know, Web 2.0 doesn't have SAM. So, mm -hmm. so how do you sustain the energy of the democratic, profoundly democratic process in a hierarchical organization? Uh, and I'm motivated to ask this because of the obvious sort of prescription that, of course, the government should work this way. Right. Uh, and Ben Franklin reminded us that it's a republic if we can keep it, which doesn't work this way at all. So if we want to think about how to graft Web 2.0 into a Republican form, small r, mm -hmm. government, how mm -hmm. does that work? So I, it's a very, very good question. And, and um, I think the important message is we're looking for the balance of both. That's why I say there is a tops down thought you need leadership. I mean, you, otherwise you have chaos, right? If if you let all flowers bloom un, untethered or un, un you know um, guided in some form or fashion, but on the other hand, the world is so global and moving so fast and unpredictably, you can't possibly come up with the answers just by people sitting at headquarters or sitting in the White House or sitting at any organizational's uh, you know top. You need to engage the innovation, the creativity of people who are closest to where the problems are. Many times they see it better than the top management. But you need both. So it's finding the right balance point between both. So, you know, so we, we have guidelines for the, the, um, the jam kinds of technologies. For example, there are guidelines. They're not strict black and white rules. They're guidelines. Be professional. Be respectful. Be courteous. You know, uh, remember, you're still an IBMer, so whatever you say, you know, you're, you're affecting the reputation of the company. They're guidelines. We have to trust our people. We, we were, I'll be honest with you, in the beginning, we were nervous. We thought we're going to, we did it inside first. We thought we're going to, all hell's going to break loose. You know, we're going to hear all the problems we have, right? What, what we found out was that, and, and this is, this is, we see this in a lot of the, maybe the gamers as well. The, 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 people, the people themselves are self-policing, self-regulating. You know, we didn't have, management didn't have to go put somebody, you know, back in the box. Their colleagues did. If they stepped over a line, it was their colleague who said, Joe, you went too far. You went too far on that. That's not what we were saying. 
And honestly, we have not had the issues that you might expect you would have. Now, Sam does participate in that. He's one of the biggest users of all of these Web 2.0 technology. Ask any of my colleagues here with me. He's always, you know, pinging, you know, using instant messaging to find out something. And, and when he wants to hear something un, un, you know, uh, ungarnished or direct, he'll go directly to employees, and, he, and they know that. They're professional, but, but, but they also will tell them things as, as it's happening real time. So I think, you know, it's not either or. You, 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 you have to look for the balance point. You can't have a totally, you know, autocratic hierarchy on one hand, nor can you have complete chaos and anything is, is valid on the other hand. It's how do you marry the best of both together. And it does require a trusting organization. It does require a trusting organization. And I, and I mentioned this earlier, but I want to reiterate it again, because I think the other thing, just as we were skeptical in the beginning when we did our first jams about what we would hear and what we would do, I'm sure our people were as well. And they, their biggest issue or concern was, will you do anything about it? If I'm telling you, if you're asking me, will you, will you listen? Or are you just doing it because you think it's nice to do, right? So that was very, very important. We had to, we had to make a commitment to not only listen and solicit input, but then to do something about it. Again, I said employees know, you know, they had thousands of ideas. They knew we can't do a thousand, but they helped us sort them just by, by nature of the topic that they were interacting on. We could do a prioritization of the things that were most important to most people and we selected those, and as I said, we gave constant feedback and status. So they knew what, was, what we were working on, who had the ownership of it, and what was the status and the completion of every one of them. So that, that's how you also build trust in, into the relationship there. So I think some of those lessons learned you know, become very, very important. I, I know Liam, uh, Liam Cleaver, my colleague here, is going to do, a, I think, a breakout session tomorrow on some of this in more detail. So he'll, I mean, he's been, he's been the brains behind setting all of this up and what's worked and how we've um, learned from some of the mistakes that we've made early on and continue to evolve it. But I think the balance point, it, it's not either or. It's, it's the ba Somebody has to make the decision at the end of the day. You need leadership, right? Pleasure was all mine. Thank you so much, Terry. And we've worked you all pretty hard today, so uh, we have a reception just across the way. Just go through the, uh, the entranceway there, and it'll be a good chance to decompress a little bit. Uh, uh, Linda, hopefully you can join us for a few minutes. Uh, enjoy a glass of wine together and, uh, and, and uh, continue our discussion. So. Eight AM start tomorrow morning. All right.